Today, 12 things every reefer should know about the science on how refugiums work on reef tanks. What we wish everyone told us day one. Quick answer, refugiums are filters that are designed to grow algae in a controlled area of the sump to suck up nutrients from our food additions. They also solve pH issues and are respected by almost everyone in the reefing community. They are the solution that you're looking for, hard stop. Number one, refugiums are more effective nutrient filters than filter socks, skimmers, and water changes combined. None of those can maintain ocean-like nutrient levels 24-7. Certainly not in a new tank. No. Uh, I have never met a protein skimmer that will keep uh, you know, really, really low nitrate and phosphate on its own. It's a combination of all these things. Filter socks, certainly not. No way. Even water changes, you know, it's just constant dilution effect. Meanwhile, refugiums, even ones that aren't even done all that well, zero oh. nitrate, zero phosphate Amazing. as a uh, measurable, you can actually adjust them even to <laughs> increase that a bit. So like refugium, one of the only options out there that it can achieve the goal on its own. Number two, in our first BRS TV investigate on refugium, we found that after seven weeks, our no fuge control was 50 part per million nitrate and a whopping 2.46 part per million phosphate. Three of our fuge options, zero, zero. Incredible. And even our hang on fuge was over six part per million nitrate and only 0.75 parts per million phosphate. When we did this experiment, everybody just kind of felt like refugiums. Maybe they work a little bit, Not maybe a they don't. Uh, in fact, nobody expected, you know, it was just adding, you know, mysis shrimp to the tank every day. Uh, nobody expected to see without the refugium 50 parts per million nitrate after seven weeks. But they certainly didn't expect like three of the options to end up zero, zero, <laughs> like on their own, no other filtration, yeah. zero, zero. And then even the like least respected option out there, which is the hang on fuge, which is largely talked about at that period of time as garbage with just like yeah, a, a little teeny thing, LED yeah. strip on the top. You know what? Brought it from 50 all the way down to 6.6. Uh, these things are absolutely effective. Number three, going back to that first BRS TV investigates on refugiums, we also found that the stronger the light, the better the impact on pH. We expected it, but it was also confirmed. Yeah, so everybody knows you turn on the pH or turn on the refugium and the pH of your tank will go up, right? Usually we do it at night to kind of balance out the day effect. And the reason for that is we increase the rate of photosynthesis and it sucks up all the carbon dioxide out of the water, increase the pH to create glucose and glycerol. In this case, during the day, it's for the coral, but at night it will be for the plant, the algae. Uh, and so what we're able to do is find out if you scale up the par of the refugium light, we scale up the rate of photosynthesis, which means we also scale up the pH. Number four, we did this experiment again and we confirmed a few things. Yeah, so in this time we took it a step farther. We created a, a system that's a little bit more like a reef aquarium, which has a powerful light on it. And we also have rock in there and then put the refugium behind. Then we put three different strengths of light back there. And what we found was all the refugiums near zero, zero again. Uh, the one, the control that doesn't have the refuge, nitrate 22 parts per million and the phosphate 0 0.38 for no fuge <laughs> there. Again, we get closer and closer to confirming the ability of the refugium to help control nutrients and pollution in our tank. Number five, again, in that second experiment, we also visually confirm this, that when the refugium light is as strong as the display light, the algae will grow in the sump rather than the display. Yeah, so what we found in this case was the one that had no fuge, uh, when we turned the lights on the front, just riddled with algae, yeah. right? But we also found though that the two that were lower par, the two lower par options for the refugium, well, it did keep the nutrients down. What it didn't do is outcompete the algae up front. What happened with when we matched the uh, Kessel, I think it was at the time H380, mm -hmm. with the fact there's a Kessel in the front, all of a sudden, the front of the tank was pristine, <laughs> and in the back is where the algae was growing, where we wanted it, in our refugium. Number six, again, in that second experiment, we confirmed that the pH benefit was directly related to the PAR output of the light. 
two times the charm, you know right? It. So we found out yet again, even in a more typical environment uh, with a sump and rock and stuff up front and normal light, we found that if we have that high par light on there, it actually increases the pH more than the low par yeah. lights, matches expectations because we're driving faster rates of photosynthesis, faster uptakes of carbon dioxide to create that glucose for the plant and raising the overall pH for the entire tank for the corals that will yeah, ultimately be in there. This is the solution for so many people that have pH issues. Number seven, we got some more good news for you. It doesn't stop there because algae also sucks up a lot of those toxins and irritants in the water column. There's all kinds of things in there that would have been sucked up by the corals, uh, bioaccumulated in the corals. But uh, in this case, it's actually going to get bioaccumulated inside of the tissue of the uh, plant That's material. Great. And then we're going to grab some and we're going to throw in the trash. <laughs> so this is actually toxin export in the most natural way. Number eight, the good news train keeps on rolling. Algae is actually leaky, and those excess carbohydrates from photosynthesis will feed the corals as well. We drive that photosynthesis rate really fast. We'll actually produce more uh, sugars than are actually needed by the plant. And the plant is what's described as leaky, meaning those carbohydrates are actually going to go into the water column, which are now available for the corals to uptake as well. So like you said, the good news <laughs> train just keeps on coming. <laughs> Number nine, I feel like a good news broken record here, but there's more good news because refugiums are where the pods breed. Mm -hmm. So the pods are where, are going to eat all uh, like your uh, uh, diatoms and everything mm -hmm. in the tank. They're going to be food for a lot of different organisms. They are your grazers. So you may not think of them as your cleanup crew, but Damn. they're walking around, mm -hmm. man, eating pests, the beginnings of algae, diatoms, all those kinds of things in your tank. And the refugium is where they get to live uh, without being pestered. And also good news in relation to that, most people are going to put them in an area or sump and all the species other than the ones with really long antennas will actually make it through the return pump mm. and back up into the tank to do all the That's things we'd like them to do. So great news there. Uh, we're going to be able to fend off pests with the refugiums, at least the ugly ones as well. Number 10. OK, there might be a complaint here, right? Sometimes they work too well. But there's good news to that complaint because you can actually adjust how efficacious they are. The amount of nutrients that are gonna be exported are directly related to the PAR level and the photo period. Yep, that means that uh, if I wanna reduce uh, the you know nutrient uptake for whatever reason, I could cut it in half yeah. by going from eight hours to four hours. Absolutely. I could cut it in half from going 300 PAR to 150 PAR. And half's probably a rough estimate here, but you get the point. These are adjustable. It is not adjustable in the same way that like a protein skimmer or a filter sock is. No. You know, those are really difficult to like nail down something, you know, definitively. But in this case, I can actually match it to the amount of food I put in. If I know how many cubes of food I put in every day, I can tune this filter to match that. Number 11, one of the only challenges of Kato is that it uptakes other elements that will need to be replenished. But there's a solution. You can use something like the two-part Triton Core or Brightwell's Cato Grow. Yeah, so uh, what will happen is you'll take up molybdenum and you'll take up iron and other mm -hmm. things that photosynthetic uh, organisms, you know, uptake. Uh, so they're not there for your corals anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, so we did pull those things out. But that, like you said, good news is there are, we call it two-part, but in this case, I think it's actually a four-part. Oh, really? But it, yeah, it's just calcium alkalinity solution with the Triton 7 what they do is they formulated that specifically to have slightly elevated photosynthetic elements for this purpose. It's designed to be used with the refugium so those things don't get depleted. But if you don't have that and you're using something else, Brightwell's Cato Grow will also do the exact same thing, which is I can just dose this to compensate. Number 12, we have an old school fallacy that's going to rear its head that a fuge needs to be big to work. It it doesn't be. That old myth was actually based on when we use these really cheap $10 bulbs. If you put on good lighting, a fuge doesn't have to be huge. Yeah, so that was based on, they used to be huge. Like they used to be two, right. three feet by three feet, big bins. And then we'd light them from like a little compact fluorescent mm -hmm. bulb you bought from Home Depot for Flip five Flip it on the side there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and well, in that case, I guess it did need to be huge. Uh, but the reality is that we can up the par and shrink that way thing down. So we just need to up the rate of photosynthesis for a smaller area and we can achieve the exact same effect. 
My number one takeaway from this whole conversation is if you don't have a sump or a place you typically put a refugium, don't overlook a hang on the back option. Yeah, they might not be the best to look at, but the benefits of them are absolutely immense. This was actually, I had one exactly like this. It was on my first 90 gallon. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, I had high windows up there and it was getting natural sunlight. Oh. And there were absolutely like whole summers where I was not very good about my maintenance, <laughs> but it never skipped a beat because I, they were growing so much Cato out of there and I just didn't have nutrient problems. And it was just a big hang on thing mm -hmm. sitting in a basically window. But now we have all these LED lights so you can create your own window and sunlight yep. effectively as well. And we're not reliant on just a, a compact fluorescent tube. My number one takeaway for this is more people should be using it. Everybody knows that it works and everybody understands. And then I also get phone calls every single day. How do I solve my nutrients? And I tell them, and there's some kind of reluctance to this one. And I don't know, maybe it's the gear junkie. I'd like it for skimmer more mm -hmm. than this thing. I don't know what it is, but there isn't an easier or more effective solution for nutrients. Certainly not one that's based on universally adopted science yeah. and will work for everyone. Learn something new about refugiums today? Maybe something unexpected? Well, there's more in our refugiums. Did you know playlist right here? New episodes of BRS TV every Monday and Friday.